podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Rachel Dininger from Ohio EPA. We will be starting the webinar in approximately one minute to give people a chance to log on. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ohio EPA's 2023 Sustainability Conference. My name is Rachel Deininger, and I am with the Division of Environmental and Financial Assistance at Ohio EPA. I will be moderating this afternoon's Brownfields, a Path to Sustainable Reuse session. Ohio EPA's 2023 Sustainability Conference has one session left after this one today and four more sessions tomorrow. Registration information and a conference agenda are located on Ohio EPA's conference webpage, and we hope that you can join us for additional conference sessions. Please remember, it's not too late to sign up for the next conference session, and all sessions are being recorded for you to view later. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items to help you participate in today's session. On this slide, you see an example screenshot of your attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your computer desktop on the right-hand side of your screen. For this presentation, you are listening in using your computer audio. If you're having sound issues or if the slides stop advancing, please try refreshing your browser. If that doesn't work, try logging off and logging back in. You can, if you continue to have issues, please let us know in the Q&A pane and one of our behind the scenes team members will try to assist you. Please feel free to submit questions to the presenters by clicking on the question mark icon and typing them into the questions pane on your attendee interface. You may send your questions at, in at any time during the presentation. We will try our best to answer the questions as they come in and during the Q&A portion, but if we don't answer your question during the Q&A, we'll provide the questions to the presenters to follow up via email following today's session. You can click on the document icon on your attendee interface to view included handouts. One of those handouts includes a PDF file of the PowerPoint slides used for today's presentation. This session is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording in a follow-up email along with a survey. The survey will also appear once the session ends. We value your feedback and would greatly appreciate it if you let us know how we're doing or if there's anything else we can do to further assist you. And with that, I would like to introduce our presenters, Richard Murray and Roxanne Anderson from Ohio EPA's Division of Environmental Response and Revitalization. Richard Murray is in his first year working as a BAP and Brownfield Project Coordinator with Ohio EPA. Richard graduated from Millsaps College with a Bachelor of Science in Biology. His past experiences include working for FEMA as an environmental specialist, as an applied researcher with NASA DEVELOP, and as an environmental scientist at the Mississippi Department of Environmental Quality. Richard enjoys outreaching with new community members and assisting them with their BAP and Brownfield requests. Roxanne Anderson is a coordinator for the Ohio Brownfields program at Ohio EPA. She coordinates with state and federal agencies, stakeholder organizations, and local governments to leverage Brownfield incentives with Ohio EPA's targeted Brownfield assessment program and grant funded technical assistance. She organizes trainings and workshops, as well as performs outreach and marketing of various Ohio EPA and other state Brownfield revitalization initiatives to local community officials, developers, and other interested parties. Roxanne enjoys thinking about how to revitalize public spaces through placemaking and strategic development while giving communities the resources needed to affect change. Roxanne has additional experience in ecological research with the USDA ARS and as a watershed coordinator. And now I'm going to present or turn the presentation over to our first presenter, Richard. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending our presentation. As Rachel mentioned, my name is Richard Murray. I am a Brownfield Project Coordinator with Ohio EPA, and with me today I have Roxanne Anderson, who is also a Brownfield Project Coordinator. Today's presentation will include an introduction to Brownfields. 
we will do a brief overview of what brownfields are. Then we will continue with sustainable reuse and how you can implement these elements into your brownfield objectives. And finally, we will wrap up our presentation with the state services we provide and how we can assist with your brownfield goals. So what is a brownfield? A brownfield is a vacant or underutilized property that is difficult to develop because it's contaminated or it is believed to be contaminated. Both the federal and state legal divisions uh, definitions presented on the screen, and you can see that the word potential is used in both paragraphs. This allows some flexibility in our designation. So with that being said, start to think to yourselves of some possible sites in your community that may fall within these definitions. If you are drawing a blank on IDing a potential brownfield opportunity, here are some of the examples you might find in your community that may be considered a brownfield. I won't read the entire list, but first on the list we have gas stations which is a common thing we see abandoned in small towns. As you continue down the list, you might see some new sites that you may not have considered before today. Is brownfield redevelopment considered sustainable reuse? Yes, absolutely. Brownfield are considered sustainable because not only does it remove possible contaminants from the environment, providing a healthier ecosystem, it also frees up and reuses existing land space, which prevents unnecessary redevelopment on current uh, green fields. When redeveloping it on a brownfield, some of the sustainable aspects are inherent, but opportunities exist to make even greater strides towards sustainable for your projects, such as reducing climate impacts and supporting local climate resilience. Few other aspects of successful and sustainable brownfield redevelopment include environmental, economic, and social impacts. Combining these elements into brownfield redevelopment is essential mechanism for ensuring the restoration and the reuse of existing brownfield properties to ensure previous cycles of decay and abandonment are not repeated. Planning is the tool and guide for implementing all three elements to your brownfield project and is one of the most essential steps to successful and thoughtful redevelopment. Brownfield sustainability must be planned. It doesn't happen by accident or without a specific direction. And planning is essentially for all projects, not just brownfields. So you can apply these tips to other community projects. You'll want to start as soon as possible. Projects like this can span from a few months, to a few years, so you will thank yourselves later for having a tangible plan to refer back to. Some of the most important aspects of implementing a successful plan is to have a champion, like a visionary, which usually the actual planner and community engagement champion. Um, your champion is the person who wants to rally, rally their community and begin the process of redeveloping a brownfield and initiate change. Also, there's someone that will continue the project and hold the community accountable for the long haul. Persistence is how these projects get done. A planner might be obvious, but having a planner can assist with understanding and bridging the gap between how the community's site reuse goals align with your economic, social, and environmental conditions. Also, planners can assist with specific planning activities, 
such as a market study that will help you and your community determine which reuses are feasible for your site. And then successful, effective, and meaningful planning can only be done when there is a strong public participation throughout the brownfield redevelopment process. Community engagement is essential. There are agencies and programs that are available to assist communities through all of these aspects, whether it is finding partners to help with the process, providing funding for planning activities, and assisting with community outreach events. If you are that champion of your community, early steps of this period can be daunting especially bringing the community together to raise awareness and establish a clear plan. You'll need to identify effective lines of communication. Each community is unique, but a good place to start is social media and town hall meetings. During these outreach via social media or town halls, you'll gain a better understanding of what your community vision is which you can implement into the sustainable reuse elements for your brownfield project. It can be difficult to establish a unified vision, but it is essential. Another thing to keep in mind is to have a productive and a collaborative atmosphere. No matter which path you use in your outreach, ensure everyone can have a voice. Establish clear expectations and always put your community vision first. An excellent example of this is a project we recently worked on in the village of Bel Air. Yes, the village of Bel Air project heavily relies on the planning and community engagement aspects that Richard just mentioned, but also touches on the other pillars of brownfield sustainability. The village of Bel Air is located in Belmont County along the Ohio River and the West Virginia border. The community, like many in Appalachia, started losing its population after hitting its peak in the 1920s. The main street of the village further declined after State Route 7 was built, which runs north to south along the state border, and funneling travelers away from the downtown area. The Ohio Brownfields program applied for and received a technical assistance grant on behalf of the village of Bel Air, and after reaching out to the mayor and attending a village council meeting, it seemed a vision plan would be the best use for the funds for the community. This image here is a depiction of three brownfield target areas that we focused on and how the corridor through the village center ties them all together. One of the most interesting and unique things about Bel Air is the Great Stone Viaduct. The historic stone bridge opened in 1871 and was the main facilitator of growth for the area, creating connectivity to commerce across multiple states. This bridge is well known and has been featured in films such as Silence of the Lambs and Unstoppable. The Ohio Brownfields program has previously provided grant funding for assessment on the viaduct area, as well as a few other brownfield properties within the community. And it seems that a vision plan would give the village tangible resources to move forward with some of their projects and set them up for success when applying for future funding. Now, this all happened in 2020, and we all know what else happened in 2020, COVID. This put a little bit of a damper on the community outreach events that we had planned to kick off the first step of the planning process. So we decided to think a little outside of the box and put together a survey. In a rural community, this can be challenging. The business owners in the area were so excited about something happening in the community that they put up flyers in their shops and put table tents up in their cafes. We were also able to promote the survey via social media through the Belmont County Community Improvement Corporation. We had an amazing and unexpected turnout for the survey, and we were able to get feedback from a much more diverse group of community members than you might get in a single meeting. The feedback was digested, and after combining the information we got from that with the market study and brownfield inventory, we targeted potential reuse plans for three brownfield sites within the community, one of which was the green space property nestled between the Great Stone Viaduct and the currently active railway bridge. This space was previously used by the railway and was significantly contaminated. It was clear that the safe outdoor space, public spaces were a priority to the community. So this particular rendering includes a playground, a community center, and some mini pitches that can double as pickleball courts. 
The Great Stone Viaduct Historical Education Society secured funding from ODOT and other sources and recently completed an accessible walkway on top of the viaduct that connects the trailhead with parking. They were also able to pave the area underneath the viaduct and provide educational signage. If you have the opportunity to go visit, I highly recommend it. The society was also a part of the vision planning process and is taking the community survey results into account as they move forward with developing the space between the bridges. The property will likely be getting over $500,000 in leveraged funds this year to complete the environmental cleanup, and the village is excited to see some of the plans come to fruition. The image on the left here is the main area under the viaduct from the viewpoint of standing on the main street, looking towards the green space that was in the previously depicted renderings. The plan proposed making this area a pedestrian walkway to connect their downtown to the, to the public space, but it is currently still a roadway. The vision plan and funding that Belair has received has created momentum and the business leaders and community members are more engaged than they have been in decades. This plan has made it possible to apply for additional grants and has recently drawn interest from local developers. The planning and community engagement for this project is helping to make the outcome sustainable. The redeveloped brownfields that are currently underway as a result of this plan will create housing, jobs, and green space while preserving the historical character and identity of the community. This project is an example that brownfields are threaded throughout every community and that they have a valuable role to play in their revitalization. As Roxanne mentioned, once you conduct community outreach events and identified your community vision, you can start implementing the sustainable reuse elements to ensure a successful re brownfield redevelopment project. There are two general categories you can consider implementing to be environmentally and sustainable. You can integrate renewable energy or energy efficient approaches in your brownfields. You can also integrate green infrastructure, which can support community efforts to become more resilient. Two of the most familiar renewable energy sources are solar and geothermal systems. Geothermal systems can transition a facility away from fossil fuels and increase overall heating and cooling efficiency. Solar panels are one of the most common and largest renewable energy sources. And I don't know who coined the term, but they are often referred to as bright fields. The US Department of Energy and US EPA have a bright fields initiative that helps provide funding to encourage the productive use of brownfields and advance the use of clean and climate friendly energy technologies. Energy efficient production can be implemented during your development and is part of your cleanup remedy. You can use machinery with clean emission technology or use energy efficient field equipment. In the new buildings or renovated properties, you can replace and upgrade lighting to LEDs or HVAC systems and install new energy efficient appliances. Also, while many of these technologies can involve high initial costs, these investments in environmental sustainability have low ongoing operation and maintenance costs and results in cost savings for your electric bill with the added benefit of increasing your property value. Environmental sustainability also includes green infrastructure. Green infrastructure can provide a green aesthetic which is calming and nice to look at, while also creating a ecological and green infrastructure. For example, to mitigate the heat island effect, you can incorporate an urban green space or create green roofs, which have been shown to have temperatures that can be 30 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit lower than those of conventional roofing. With the added benefit of reducing stormwater runoff while attracting wildlife like birds. So this is the former um, Crestie department store building on the previous slide. 
<laughs> there we go. Um, it's in Canton, which is an excellent example of green reuse. The department store thrived in the 30s and 40s, but became partially vacant and run down in the 80s. With the help of a state brownfield grant, the city spent about $2 million to acquire and clean up the area in the early 2000s. The city began the process of addressing a dilapidated downtown with, you guessed it, planning. The city first began planning for a, a green space with their 2013 downtown development plan, which was then incorporated later into their comprehensive plan that gave recommendations on how Canton should focus on its resources. While this is only a small part of the city's journey of revitalizing its downtown, Centennial Plaza sits in the heart of the city where the Crestview building used to be and has become the setting for concerts, graduation parties, Browns watching parties, to each their own, and more, helping to define a new Canton. From an environmental perspective, the green space is reducing and slowing stormwater runoff and increasing permeable surface area in the city. This relieves stress on stormwater infrastructure and reduces the heat island effect. Canton is proof that green space end use can add just as much value as its brick and mortar counterparts by increasing interest in flow, providing social and health benefits, and increasing adjacent property values and investment in the area. Another great example of this is the American Industrial Buildings and Art Metal Site in Cleveland, a classic story of a brownfield turned brightfield. The American industrial property was used for commercial and industrial purposes beginning in the early 1900s. Over the years, the property was used for auto manufacturing, corrugated cardboard box manufacturing, wallpaper production, and metal plating operations. The art metal site was also developed in the early 1900s, and its first developed use was a parking area for a church, but later uses including a welding supply warehouse and a series of art metal businesses that manufactured primarily fire escapes and iron railings. The project was vacant for decades and conditions on significant portions of the site were deteriorated beyond repair. Around 2014, an energy company acquired over $3 million in Clean Ohio Brownfield grants to remediate and create what is to believe to be at the time the largest urban solar field in the country. The renewable energy is now pumped into Cleveland's public power grid, benefiting nearby university facilities. One of my favorite sustainable reuses of a brownfield here in Columbus is the Whittier Peninsula, or what we lovingly call it, Scioto Audubon Metro Park. Originally, this project property consisted of approximately 137 acres that was historically used since the 1870s for industrial purposes. These activities included sand and gravel mining, the manufacturing of concrete products, unlicensed landfill activities, storage of cars and other vehicles on city and town lots, manufacturing at the former warehouse, Lazarus Warehouse, electroplating a coal yard, an asphalt plant, a steel foundry, and a railroad yard. Whew. The City of Columbus and Franklin County Metropolitan Park District took the property through the Ohio EPA Voluntary Action Program. The peninsula was sectioned off and cleaned up in stages with completion dates ranging from 2008 to 2015. Assistance for the project was provided by a Clean Ohio Brownfield Grant, a US EPA Brownfields Cleanup Revolving Loan Fund, and other funding sources from the Ohio Department of Development and Office of Urban Development. The Scioto Audubon Metro Park was a multi-year effort that restored wetlands and grasslands as well as riverside access for recreational purposes. The Grange Audubon Insurance Nature Center is located on the site as the property is located in a popular migratory path for many bird species. Bicycle and walking trails lace the property, connecting it to surrounding areas and other recreational facilities are available as well, notably the very popular outdoor climbing wall. The Metro Park is a hub for education and connection, but also provides an incredibly important space for animal species and vegetation all with a spectacular view of downtown Columbus. With planning and funding, this heavily contaminated brownfield became a valuable community and environmental resource. Economic sustainability is usually one of the most prominent considerations when taking on a brownfield redevelopment. I just want to take a second and highlight the success of the US EPA's brownfield program as a whole. Through the fiscal year of 2022, 
The country on average leveraged about $19 for each EPA brownfield dollar expended, leading to a total of $36.12 billion leverage. It's billion with a B. And about 10 jobs were leveraged per 100,000 of EPA brownfield funds expended on assessments, cleanup, and revolving loan fund, leading to approximately 193,000 jobs created. In a study of only 48 brownfields, local governments generated 29 to $97 million additional tax revenue in the first year after cleanup. Then, a study in 2017 concluded that cleaning up brownfield properties led to an increase in residential property value of 5 to 15.2% within the 1.2 miles of the site. What an incredible impact sustainable brownfield redevelopment has made on the states. With these numbers, we can understand that brownfield redevelopment can really cause a splash and then ripple, creating an economic growth beyond the project site. This is because success oftentimes breeds success. People will look at your achievements and decide, I wanna be a part of that. And once your community is able to document and show success with its first redevelopment, you have started down a path of increasing local development capacity. I'm not saying you won't need any future assistance, but the cultivated growth shifted your community's development area. <clears throat> the American CAM building in Cincinnati is an excellent example of increasing development capacity, as it has stimulated the redevelopment of an adjacent former lumber yard and brownfield site that the city has been looking to redevelop for years. This beautiful building dates back to 1921 and was primarily used in the manufacturing of can making machinery and parts until 1961. Subsequent uses of the property included mixed industrial and commercial use, including machining and sheet metal operations. All industrial and commercial activity ceased in 2006 and shortly after a local redevelopment company purchased the property. The developer used a combination of multiple development financing tools for the project, including Clean Ohio Brownfield grants for its remediation and over $7 million in tax credits for historical preservation. This building, historical building was renovated and reopened its doors in 2011. The building was converted into mixed use space with 110 loft apartments and 12,000 square feet of commercial space, boasting an urban li living lifestyle, including green spaces, a cafe on the first floor of the building, and amenities and walking distance, such as restaurants, boutiques, drugstores, and hardware stores. The development spurred an additional 56 unit senior living facility that was also constructed at the site and opened in 2017. The building is now a historic landmark, regional destination, and an anchor for the renewed development in Cincinnati's Northside neighborhood. As many as 450,000 people in Cuyahoga County live in a food desert, meaning they don't have access to healthy food. The county received Clean Ohio Brownfield funds to conduct cleanup at the Old Miles Shopping Plaza, which led to the redevelopment of the seven acre lot into a fully refreshed plaza, including a grocery store. The old plaza was first developed in the 1920s and had a variety of retail uses, including a restaurant, auto part sales, appliance store, bakery, shoe store, nightclub, barber shop, warehouse, multiple uses. The county worked with a development corporation to create an expanded supermarket, 30,000 square feet of new retail, a new parking lot and green space. Miles Supermarket is the cornerstone of the new plaza, and in addition to providing access to healthy food, the store created 60 new jobs. Three other businesses are located in the plaza, creating an estimated 60 to 80 additional jobs and increasing tax revenue for the city. The Flats East Development Area is one of Cleveland's most significant mixed-use development projects and a poster child of any riverfront industrial city. The East Bank of the Flats is one of Cleveland's oldest developed areas and has been the location of heavy industrial development for over 100 years. Historical operations on the property included elevator warehousing, fishnet storage, boat building and storage, fish packing and warehousing, steel storage, grinding, painting, glazing, shop painting, printing, welding, machining. Wait, I'm not done. 
scrap iron storage, oil and chemical storage, coke handling, metalworking, and manufactured gas generation. As the needs of Cleveland changed in the early 1980s, many portions of the property were used as parking lots by various nightclubs and restaurants. The bars and clubs slowly degenerated, and after several drownings and shootings, the flats earned a poor safety reputation and establishments began closing. The area was almost completely abandoned and buildings left vacant when Flats East Development began purchasing properties and raising abandoned structures in the early 2000s. The project received two Clean Ohio Brownfield grants as well as other development financing tools and it required extensive planning that ties into the city's comprehensive plan. Remedial activities assisted with the installation of additional storm sanitary water and electric lines and infrastructure improvements also included the installation of new combined sewer overflow piping. The area includes a hotel, an office tower, apartments, and an entertainment district with over $500 million of redevelopment invested and over 2,500 jobs created. The Flats is a mixed-use industrial, recreational, entertainment, and residential area, establishing a new trend in experience-driven, mixed-use living. This project exemplifies the impact of a community reclaiming industrial spaces that frequently occupy some of the most valuable assets in communities. So in general, when your neglected communities get revitalized and longtime residents and business owners who suffer through the bad times and stuck uh, with your community, you should be able to share in the good times with them. However, as these communities attract more investments, they often become more expensive, making it harder for existing residents and business owners to stay, if not considered in your planning process. Here are a few topics you can keep in mind when planning for social sustainability. So first, affordable housing. We all need a place to live, right? If you can offer a range of different housing types, this makes it possible for senior and current citizens to stay in their neighborhoods as they age. But you also want new families, right? new folks coming in and experiencing what makes your community special and create a life of their own. So you'll need to work with your partners and planner to accommodate for new homeowners to invest while keeping your original folks in the community. Second is taxpayer investment. I would recommend to engage with your local officials to establish development policies and prioritize that tax dollars are used wisely to protect public health, welfare of your community, but also have a balance with the needs of your developers. Having the freedom to choose how to travel can create a bridge for those who have limitations. Think about the choices you have for your getting around town. In many places in this country, you must use a car because the other options are just not safe, practical, or even possible. You and your community should consider options for those who can't or choose not to own a car. This can be for your children and seniors who want more independence and for people who might want to drive to work one day and then bike the next. The final option to consider is creating a healthy community for all ages. Think about how to design with people in mind. Pay careful attention to the experience each person will have with the street, the, the sidewalk, the surrounding area. You can create a healthier interconnected community by integrating walking trails or simply by creating a walkable neighborhood. Places designed for people to be active are also places that enable people to stay in the same community. So an excellent example um, of these aspects is Wineland Park in Columbus. This is the Columbus Coat of Fabrics Company, which was established in 1902 and manufactured oil coated and plastic coated cloth and paper. Operations on the property ceased in 2002 and the US EPA removal actions occurred in 2004. 
With the help of a $3 million brownfield cleanup grant from Clean Ohio, demolition and site cleanup included over 40,000 tons of soil needing to be removed. This process was a long time in the making. To give you a picture of how this project came to fruition, in the 1990s, City Council adopted the University Neighborhoods Revitalization Plan, which offered a comprehensive approach to neighborhood improvement. In 2003, campus partners completed land acquisition and demolition of a major mixed-use redevelopment project on High Street on the north end of Wineland Park, which is now known as South Campus Gateway for the Ohio State University. This and many other dominoes eventually led to the Columbus's planning division preparing the Wineland Park Neighborhood Plan in 2004. A model for inclusive community-based revitalization, the Wineland Park Neighborhood Plan is a comprehensive and coordinated program to improve and enhance the quality of life for current and future residents. As a result, City Council approved the designation of Wineland Park as one of the city's neighborhood investment districts to provide tax incentives to homeowners and rental property owners for the renovation and new construction of housing. In 2007, the new Wineland Park Elementary School and the Schoenbaum Family Center opened and are co-located within the four acre city park behind those buildings. In 2009, J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation, the Columbus Foundation, and Campus Partners created a joint fund to acquire vacant, abandoned, and foreclosed properties in Wyland Park with a focus on the most distressed properties that are not likely to be renovated by the private market. And finally, in 2012, the first 40 new single-family homes were constructed on the Columbus Code of Fabric site, financed with low-income housing tax credits. The goal of the project is revitalization rather than gentrification with a diverse mixed income area. Historically, the area lost about 2,000 residents and 500 households between the 70s and early 2000s, but the neighborhood plan includes just over 2,000 households and approximately 5,000 residents. This project is a great example of how many partners and layers there can be and how heavily contaminated properties can be incorporated with an involved community and extensive planning. I highly recommend looking up Wineland Park. Um, they have a long history on their website of all of the steps included in this. It was extensive. The River Valley Hospital property was constructed in 1936 in Ironton and is comprised of nearly 4.3 acres. In 2007, the Ironton Port Authority and the Ironton Lawrence County Community Action Organization utilized a Clean Ohio Brownfield grant to demolish the building and subdivided the property into 20 individual lots for resale to private individuals for market rate housing. This development helped meet housing demands for young families in an aging community. The Pequa Memorial Medical Center property served as a cemetery in the 1800s, but by 1870 the land was no longer used for burials and the graves were relocated. The property began operation as a hospital under the name Ball Memorial Hospital in 1905, and in 1906, a nurses training school was constructed on the property. The nurses quarters served as a dormitory and school for nurses in training. The hospital eventually um, ceased its operations in 1996. In 2010, the city received over $2 million from a Clean Ohio Brownfield grant for demolition and asbestos abatement. 85% of the materials removed from the building that were not contaminated, such as steel, bricks, and concrete, were recycled for future use. The school district purchased the land from the city of Piqua for $1, and the intermediate school was completed in 2015 and houses approximately 900 students. Seeing some of these projects, it is clear that there are a lot of things to consider when implementing a brownfield redevelopment plan. Some of you might have worries or concerns about your capacity to manage and follow through with these elements or find the resources needed to implement them. But no need to worry, it can be done and you have a team of experts here to help. If you need any, any assistance with your Brownfields projects or just have questions on where to start, connect with us, the Targeted Brownfield Assessment Program, and we will point you in the right direction. Our Targeted Brownfield Program, or TBA, 
aims to promote redevelopment of a brownfield site by providing free, just making sure free environmental assessment services to your community to assist transforming the brownfield properties to economic and community assets. Again, at no cost, you can apply for TBA funding throughout the year on a rolling basis. And for example, some of the assessments we typically fund are phase ones, phase twos, and asbestos surveys. You can find a copy of the TBA application on our website, but feel free to connect with us, contact us. We would be more than happy to answer any additional questions. Now that we have a brief idea of the TBA program, let's talk about who's eligible. Regarding the applicant, they must be a government or nonprofit entity. They cannot be the cause or contributor to the suspected contamination, and they do not need to own the property, but the property owner must grant legal access to the applicant, Ohio EPA, and our contractors. Residential is eligible if more than four units and cannot be under CERCLA or the national priorities list. If you have a property that you're unsure of, again, please connect with us and we can discuss. To clarify, the list on the screen is but a few of the services the TBA program provides. And you can see the full list on our website. Overall, these free services can work in collaboration and preparing for a project's next step or share costs for a larger project. Again, these services are no cost to you. Once we determine if your project is eligible with the applicant, we can offer our services, which include a market analysis, which assesses an entire community or a specific area, and among other things, can um, identify feasible reuse options for a brownfield redevelopment. Phase one, which is recommended prior to purchasing any property and highly recommended as a starting point. Additional phase one is also a prereq for the Ohio EPA VAT program. Once a phase one is completed, you can use that information to start sampling the property under a phase two assessment. This could include collection of soil, groundwater, sediment, soil gas, and indoor air samples. Then we have brown, uh, brownfield inventories. This provides Detailed information on brownfield properties, along with steps to help you successfully navigate through the process of reusing. And then asbestos survey. This is required for demolition or renovation of a structure. Um, we got planning activities, which would include a vision planning, which is a brownfield revitalization plan based on the community's vision. And finally, we offer geophysical surveys, which can help determine if underground storage tanks are present. As Richard mentioned, we are available if you have any questions. Um, on here is a link to um, our website and our contact information, as well as some of the resources that we used. We are always available, as well as our management and additional Brownsfield um, team to both help you with our current TBA program and potentially linking you to other financial options through either federal or community or local levels that can help you with these types of sustainable redevelopment. If you are interested in learning more about Brownfields, you can use this QR code right here to sign up um, for our Brownfield listserv. So we send out messages on a regular basis about grant funding coming up, trainings, workshops, um, and other opportunities. So this is a great um, method to kind of keep in touch with what's going on within the state. And with that, we can take any questions. All right. Um, thank you, Richard and Roxanne. Like Roxanne just said, um, now we're going to go and um, take some questions from the audience that you guys chatted in during the session. 
And our first question of the day is, how can targeted brownfield assessment funding be used along transit corridor corridors, excuse me, to promote transit oriented development? So for this specifically, our TVA program um, is essentially for any brownfield. So if you have an area that needs um, an initial phase one assessment or anything like that, we can provide that. It doesn't really matter what it's going to be utilized for. However, a lot of the times, a lot of our assessments can be utilized um, in creating a, a packet for a grant application that will get you the transit oriented funding that you need through either ODOT, or um, the US Department of Transportation. They have a lot of funding right now for um, transit-oriented development. And a lot of times um, the assessment of the property that you are applying for funds for um, need to be assessed. And so we can help with that. That is great stuff. Um, okay, so our next question is, um, do you have any links to resources for solar on brownfields? or for funding to support solar development on brownfields? We do have a few resources that I can kind of um, send out after the fact. There um, are some initiatives that we mentioned earlier that are through both um, the U.S. Department of Energy and the U.S. EPA. Um, in addition to that, there is some funding that you can find through KSU TAB, which was mentioned earlier. It's our federal counterpart with brownfields. They're familiar with um, a lot of entities that do that, but for the most part, because it's a lot of private development and a development base, you're probably gonna be looking at other federal agencies that will fund that, like the EDA. So we do have some, and I can point you in the right directions, um, but yeah, that's all I can say about that, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I would like to go ahead and add to that too, and I will say that I know um, property assessed clean energy financing can also be used for, um, energy efficiency and solar upgrades on on brownfield properties that's something that's been done in the past as well yeah pace is a great resource yeah so yes to answer your question there are resources out there and we will follow up with some of those links all right so another question we have is um are is there any funding available that would help with some of the sustainable sustainability areas you mentioned such as energy and affordable housing so as far as funding for that, our TBA program can help um, your community kind of guide you towards um, getting ready for that and assessing the property. As far as implementing affording, affordable housing or um, putting it on a brownfield, I know that you can get financing and grants through HUD. Um, and I believe there are a few other opportunities through the EDA depending on what avenue you take or what it's being built on. So um, our program specifically, again, is there to help you get your property ready and to plan for these types of fundings and to direct you in the direction of these fundings. We can help you connect those dots for what you need to get a project done. Um, and there are so many sources out there right now for funding, so we just need to help get you directed to the right place. Awesome, that's great. Um... It's nice that there's a lot of funding out there for the, these sorts of things right now. All right, our next question is, are there particular government partners who should be engaged when considering brownfield development? Um, when you're doing any type of development within a community, um, you should have all of the government entities involved in some capacity because these are usually a very holistic approach to being successful on the environmental, economic, um, and social aspects. So all of them need to work together, both the environmental and the economic arms of the government, um, as well as using their planning departments um, to move forward. When you work in silos, a lot of times things are missed, areas are missed, residents are missed, um, and they can also share resources to discover what type of funding crosses the aisle, as it were, um, and can work for the project that they didn't think would work because it's also being utilized in another one of those areas. So all of them, essentially, but <laughs> those are the three main ones, the planning, the economic, and the environmental. That makes sense to me. All right, so I think that's all the questions that we have time for today. So thank you again, Roxanne and Richard, for presenting today. And thank you all for joining us.
this webinar has been recorded and you will receive an email after the webinar with a link to the recording and a link to the session survey. All right, and before we end the session today, we would like to point your attention to a couple of the Recycling and Sustainability Units programs. So the um, Ohio EPA's yearly recycling grant program supports communities, nonprofits, businesses, and schools to initiate or, it, or expand recycling programs, encourage sustainable practices, stimulate economic growth, and support litter prevention efforts through five different grants. Applications are, are online and open October 2nd and close December 1st. Please visit RecycleOhio.gov for more information. Additionally, um, we have an Encouraging Environmental Excellence Award Program. The Encouraging Environmental Excellence Award Program has three categories that recognize any Ohio business, industry, trade association, professional organization, or not-for-profit, Ohio K-12 public or private schools, and local governments for environmental stewardship commitments and practices. Online, online applications are open for the 2024 award cycle and will close on April 30th, 2024. To learn more, visit epa.ohio.gov slash Ohio E3. Before we end, please check out our upcoming sessions for the 2023 Sustainability Conference. Join us at 2.30 p.m. for the Truth About Ohio's Recycling to hear information from industry experts about recycling in Ohio. Tomorrow morning, make sure to check out our Green Healthcare, Healing Patients and the Planet at 9 a.m. and Opportunities in Energy Development, Understanding Your Role at 10.30 a.m. Once you leave, you will receive a survey. We value your feedback and would greatly appreciate it if you let us know how we are doing and let us know if there's anything we can do to further assist you. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with links to view a recording of today's session, a certificate of attendance, and another link to the survey if you do not, do not get a chance to complete it now. And with that, we will end this session of Ohio EPA's 2023 Sustainability Conference. We hope you can join us for additional sessions. Thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful day.